Good evening. Uh, my name is Jadine Collingwood, and I am Associate Curator at the MCA. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program, which is organized in conjunction with the exhibition Nicole Eisenman, What Happened? The galleries will be open until 9 p.m. tonight, um, so I hope you'll have a chance to view the show. Um, and please also join us for a book signing outside of the theater at the conclusion of the talk. Before we begin, uh, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones, unless, of course, you're using uh, your phone for captioning. Thank you also to our generous funders, a list of whom you can see here on the screen behind me. Tonight's program is the first in a new quarterly program series held at the MCA, Politics of Poetics. It highlights today's leading poets whose practices traverse the political through writing, teaching, and activism. This series showcases the vibrant collaboration and artistic exchange shared between poets and visual artists. And it is precisely this kind of shared exchange that has brought Nicole Eisenman and C.A. Conrad together for several projects. Eisenman's works have appeared on covers for two of C.A. Conrad's uh, poetry collections, their breakout, The Book of Frank, and their latest book, Listen to the Golden Boomerang Return. The two have also collaborated on poetry projects, including Eisenman's 12 Poets Project for Ursula Magazine. Since 1975, C.A. Conrad has worked with the ancient technologies of poetry and ritual. They have received the Ruth Lilly Poetry Prize a Penn Joseph, Josephine Miles Award, a Creative Capital Grant, a Pew Fellowship, and a Lambda Award. They also exhibit poems as art objects with recent solo shows in Spain and Portugal. And their play, The Obituary Show, was made into a film in 2022 by the artist Augusto Cascales. Please join me in welcoming C.A. Conrad. Hi, everybody. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, let me put this right here. I don't know what I'm doing. I'll put that there. That's fine. Um, thank you so much for having me, and thank you all for being here. Oh, I need my glasses. I keep acting like I don't. So this book that you see up there, uh, Nicole, that's Nicole's painting called um, Luck Lines. It's a really wonderful painting. And um, this is a book that I wrote over a 17, uh, 18 year period before I started using um, the somatic poetry rituals. I just want to very briefly explain to you what these rituals are and why I use them. So I started writing in 1975, and then, well, let me just say that most of my lines for the poems were on the left margin. But then by 2005, if you jump ahead, I ran away to the city. I grew up in this rural part of Pennsylvania where everybody is a factory worker, and that has a lot to do with this story. Anyway, I go to Philadelphia as a teenager in the 80s, and uh, I lose about half of everybody I know to AIDS, which you know plays a big role in every single thing that I do from that day forward. But besides that, um, I was doing exactly what I wanted to do as far as running, be I didn't want to work in the factories, I wanted to be a writer, I wanted to be around artists, and I was doing that. But in 2005, I started making friends with some MFA students in a graduate program for writing. And their lives they were leading and their writing lives were connected in a way that mine was not. And I wasn't exactly sure what, what, you know, what that was about. And the more I looked into it, I realized that it is our backgrounds. These, 
um, new friends come from white collar workers. Their parents were doctors and lawyers, engineers, and I came from factory workers. And if you work at a factory, you literally become an extension of a machine for most of your waking hours. And in order to survive that job, and I know that sounds very grand of me to say, do you need to survive this? But you do. Just imagine being present for eight to 10 hours a day, because nobody's really working eight hours anymore, as an, as a, at a metal punch machine. You would lose your mind. So you need to shut the present off, and then your mind goes into the past and the future all day at work. And they don't know how to flip that switch when they go home, it seems. So when I talk to my family, they're either depressed about the past or anxious about the future. So I realized in 2006 that I needed a new relationship with time. That's where these rituals come into play. They are basically uh, very unorthodox steps to anchor me in the present. And um, I did, I was doing these for years and loving it. It was very exciting. And then I had a very unfortunate uh, situation where a boyfriend of mine was murdered. And um, I did a ritual to overcome that depression. I don't want to get into all that. But um, let me just go to the next slide. This is Amanda Paradise. This is, um, the new book is different. This is the most the, this is the previous one. In this book I was working with, it's called Amanda Paradise Resurrect Extinct Vibration. Oh, that's, uh, I guess I'll just do this. I don't know, I put these in this weird order. Okay, so yeah, this is, uh, this is the book that I'm, that came out last year in England. So I work with Peng UK Penguin Books and then in the States I work with Wave Books. This is where I thought I was going. So this is um, information from the World Wildlife Association. They have a planet index that is a biennial report. Every two years they let us know. It's an accumulation of many activists and scientists who get together and they look, they're looking at the health of the planet. And the most recent report claims that we've lost 70% of the wildlife on the planet. And with this book, what I did was, this is a blanket that was made for me by the Pew Charitable Trusts, which was nice. That's a quote from a manifesto I wrote. I'm not really into manifestos. They tend to be, I'm just, that's just water. It's just water. We're mostly made of water, so it's all right. Um, you know what I mean. So um, I just derailed myself. What was I saying? <laughs> Sorry. Here. Do not fall. Okay, well, anyway, I forget what I was saying all of a sudden. I don't know why. It's like the older I get, the more that happens. So um, I forget what I was just saying. Anyway, so let me just jump ahead and say that... Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, Andre Breton. Did you ever read his manifestos? Just a tyrant, you know, just not interested. <laughs> These bossy, awful men. So my, my manifesto is like a right to manifest. It's like an anti-manifesto. But what I would do is I, would, I, was try, I got a creative capital grant to finish this, which was great. I was so excited to get that opportunity. I went to all 50 states, and I would lie on this blanket and flood my body with the field recordings of recently extinct animals. This is another part of the ritual. I set, it took me months to set this up. I took copper water bottles, copper because it's highly conductive, and filled them with equal amounts of amethyst, carnelian, and rose quartz. And then water for the charge, like you would a battery, for, with about an inch to, at the top for freezing. And then I buried these containers in Minneapolis. That was the first one. It was very, a very American word. It's the Lakota word for water infused with the Greek word for city, water city, Minneapolis. And I, I prefer that over St. Paul, you know, because that's the, the neighboring city. And St. Paul is, you know, his letters in um, the New Testament are the reason so many queers are being murdered. So I didn't want to deal with that. And then Memphis, Tennessee, which is named after the much fabled ancient city of Memphis, Egypt, where, where well, I've read at least that ceremonial magicians would, it was sitting, it sits right at the mouth of the Nile, taking all that energy, and they would um, do ceremony and then send that energy due west to Giza, where the pyramids are. Memphis, 
Tennessee is sitting right at the jawbone of the Mississippi after several hundred tributary rivers have fed the river and it's just this massive body of water. Somebody has erected a 40-story glass pyramid on the Memphis side overlooking Arkansas. I'm assuming it's an homage to Egypt. And then Cheyenne, Cheyenne, Wyoming, because when I was a teenager in Philly, there was a trans woman named Peppy who was about 20 years older than my friends and I. Um, she was the first person, she was Native American. She was the first person who ever taught me about crystals. I didn't come from a place where people talked about crystals. But anyway, I wanted to honor um, Peppy because she died of AIDS in the 90s. And she had a sister who lived in Cheyenne she hoped to visit before she died, and she did not. Oh, I didn't tell you what I do. And then there's a fourth bottle in Omaha, Nebraska. That's the seat. So after I finally set this up, it's thousands of miles. Then when I'm traveling across the country, I would go to Omaha, sit on top of that bottle underground, and then with a compass, align myself with Minneapolis, and then eat a little bit of dirt from the Minneapolis location, and then listen to an ambient recording of that location, and then write, and then deosil with the sun so then down to memphis eat a little memphis dirt listen to memphis sounds write cheyenne those three bodies of dirt look very different in the bags you know very tasted very different too one's a little saltier but i enjoyed that and then when i was finished i dug all those up you had to act like you were you know undercover because it looks like i'm I don't know, bearing bombs or something. <laughs> then I took him back to Peppy's old apartment and put the stones on the step, and then somebody they took them away. I want to read one of the poems from that book, and then I'm going to move on to the new thing. So I want to I want to read this one because um, Angela Conant, who's a curator of the EFA in New York City, contacted me. This is something that has happened in the past. It's absolutely a joy to work with Nicole Eisenman because Nicole truly understands the idea of collaboration. I'm not here to gossip and I don't, I'm usually the subject of it, so I'm not interested, but I will say this, a famous photographer whose name will not be mentioned, their assistant, and I won't even tell you the gender, uh, wrote to me saying, so-and-so would really like you to write a poem about one of their photos for this anthology. And I was like, oh, well, will so-and-so take a photograph in honor of one of my poems? Well, no, that's not how it works. Well, you need to stop this immediately. It's an insult to poetry. Poets have been abused by visual artists for centuries. <laughs> but not here at the MCA. Um, and um, Nicole really does... Uh, actually collaborate. I'll show you a collaboration in a minute. It's really great. But anyway, um, I said, no, thank you. She wanted me to read the, this poem at the opening of the sh group show. And I said, no, thank you. I don't do that. And she's like, well, what does that mean? And I said, I'm not here for you. You know, I am the art world. And she said, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, I just want my poem in the show. It's, you said, this is a good poem for the show. So put it on the wall. And, um, she thought about it, and the next day she called me back. She's like, you know what? I'm going to put it on nine feet of chiffon, which this is all about warfare and toxic masculinity. I can't think of a single piece of male-identified clothing made from chiffon, so it was brilliant. About a foot from the wall, so it shimmered constantly. Memories of why I stopped being a man for Jason Dodge. Jason Dodge is one of my favorite living visual artists, if you're familiar with Jason Dodge. It's normal if your cock gets hard while you are shooting, my uncle told me on my first deer hunt. Pythagoras knew the music of Jupiter and Mercury long before Nassau. But to begin again, no hero itching at the door. That never-ending search for weakness in neighbors, siblings, coworkers, rival football teams. After seeing the open body of muscle and blood, we had horrible ideas about what to do with our lives. Imagine how they gathered around the first cannon ever fired. Sweaty, excited, rock hard. Before he died, Kalishnikov confessed to suffering unbearable nightmares. Surrender your nouns to my verbs, he said, he said, he said, he said. In a game of Russian roulette, I want a pair of glasses that can see the wind. I walk around town each night, 
watching the slightest breeze approach dry leaves like a premonition. After a million years of dreaming, the solution is still the same. Hold me to your bruised song until it warms me right. So this is the new book. This is the American cover. I, after working with all those extinct animals for years, I realized in the, right in the middle of doing that that I needed to fall in love with the world the way it is, not the way it was. We're not going to be able to progress. We have to fall in love with, you know, what's left to protect it. This is the um, cover with Nicole Eisenman's painting. It's called Groundsweller, this painting. It's a beautiful painting. And uh, so this, the publication date is today for the American version, April 9th. Thank you. And then the publication date for this is, well, it's, it's May 5th, which is Cinco de Mayo, isn't it? Oh, that's great. I don't know. I have to do something special. So let me just say I, um, I was living on the road for over a decade. After the ritual that I mentioned earlier to help me get my depression from my boyfriend's death, I um, said, you know what? I got to get out of the city. There are just too many streets in Philadelphia where I knew people who died, and it was just a ghost town to me, and I hated it. So I thought, you know what? I'll live on the road for a year. And it turned into a decade plus. And then COVID happened. And then I was pulled off the road, as you can imagine. And I wound up in the city of Seattle, Washington. And I don't know if you're too familiar with uh, Seattle, but it is one of the world's largest populations of crows. In fact, the Bothell campus at the University of Washington at the edge of the city has one of the largest known uh, roosts. 16,000 crows live together there. They cross that campus twice a day and they just darken the sky and shit on everybody and yell at them. And the thing is, crow justice is absolutely real in that city. I have watched it. Uh, the cats, oh, cats in Seattle live in absolute terror. They, they run from tree trunk to tree trunk with their, with their, with their, with their backs hunched like, I don't see me, and the crows are right above them just like, get out of here, you fucking cat. Screaming at them, just screaming, screaming, screaming. You can't escape them. And then you see where this is uh, over to the, well, it'd be your left. There's, there's a courtyard, and then there's another balcony parallel with Mayan. And the, man, and the crows like to sit on his, this man's railing of his balcony to have a conversation at dawn. And he didn't like that, and he would shoo them off with a broom. And these crows started attacking him at wherever he, whenever they would see him, um, going to his car. I mean, they would really go at him. So I thought that was kind of lovely. This crow in particular started having lunch with me. I, um, they would come hundreds of crows a day and I would feed them. But this crow would sit with me and eventually I was allowed to stroke their beak and this little bit of feathers on their forehead. And then they started bringing me gifts. And the first gift this crow brought me um, is a twig, as you see. And I first, you know, I wasn't exactly sure if it was really for me. It seemed pretty clear in a way because it, the crow would shake it and then sit it down and tap the glass and then pick it up and shake it. And <clears throat> but when that second gift came, can you see it there? It's a small piece of plastic, translucent plastic nub. It's like as big as your pinky nail. And it was a decision. It was very clear that they were like, I know who's going to like this. <laughs> and, um, and they were right. I did. And then three is a seed, and then uh, four, five, six, and seven are something I needed a lot of. I don't know what that was. And then eight is a linden tree seed, which is not indigenous to that. It's a rainforest, you know, Seattle. And um, it rained for over 100 days while I was there. I was not used to that. It was terrible. Um, for me, it was. And then the ninth was this piece of pine bark, which, you know, that is what the forest is made of. And then 10 was a piece of dried commercial cat food that they really had a hard time um, letting go of. I kept saying, I'm vegan. It's okay. And then 11 was a little like green nub of something very sweet. And then the 12th gift was a piece of gold foil. And 
On that evening of the first gift, I had a dream that the crow brought me gold. It was really lovely. It's on the 12th. It's like the 12 days of Christmas. And then I, and then I, I, in the dream, this is like bossy ex-boyfriend is like demanding that I thank the crow. Then after, then after lockdown, I would just like, because I'm a Capricorn, we're really good alone. Like all my Pisces friends were calling me like, oh my God, you know, it's like write a poem with me, write some poems. You know what I mean? You know what I mean? Like you write poems. And, um, but then I thought, you know what? I think I want to still be alone. So I got this residency in Joshua Tree and I was in the desert working with the coyotes. And this is when I began to morph the ritual a bit where I'm embodying it. Uh, the different animals. There are kangaroo rats that I worked with. And then I uh, worked with the macro in Rome, the modern museum, and talked my way into being an exhibit there. I lived in the museum 24 hours a day for about two weeks. And I would run down to the fountain to feed the rats and the pigeons every morning. And I worked with this woman who was in her 80s. And uh, she was like, the police will arrest you and me for feeding rats. So we had to like do look out for one another for the rat. And the thing is the rats in Rome are not rats. They're not the kind of rats I'm used to. They're very friendly and they're very, so like somebody's blow drying them. They're very soft and <laughs> I don't know, tidy. Okay, let me just read some of these poems. So this is all from Listen to the Golden Boomerang Return. Our first lightning strike was convulsive. We felt sad for our violence after exterminating wolves and bison. We do not need a doctor to say, dance, 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 before the song runs out. Learn how to live so wilderness never becomes mythology. We put them in parks to be wild on purpose, a museum of fur, fangs, and hooves. Part of this forest tastes like the man I love with an actual number of nails holding the bedroom together. Other days when we died where we fell, we became the forest. My car never intended to be a meat grinder, another face going under the waves. We felt awful after hitting the deer. We made love and slept with one of his antlers between us. And, you know, this is like, this book's out now, and I have to read these poems. It's like these love poems for, or for somebody who I broke up with last year. But you know what? I don't know. i got to read the book, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, this one was very fancy. This one got into the New York Times. Uh, Ann Boyer published it in the Times, which is very fancy, right? But Ann wrote to me. She's like, oh, I'm really sorry that people are trashing you. And the comment, she was like, ooh, let me go. See, like they don't have what it takes to like tear me down. You know what I mean? Like they've, they haven't lived where, you know, forget it. And it's just these crabby old men like, you don't know how to make line breaks. Here, and they were rewriting my poem over and over again. And I would just say, thank you, daddy. You know. <laughs> They're poor wives. <laughs> we stop studying the night sky for directions. If someone said we made it up, planet Earth isn't real, we would try to verify, try to be sure. Critics are the evidence we do not trust ourselves. Your imagination is asking for parole. What is your verdict, warden? Try to always remember the calendar made of light our ancestors followed to pass the year. So this is something from Ursula magazine. Um, there was this, I was invited to be part of this, and I just love Nicole because Nicole didn't just ask us to write poems for her paintings. She said, or if you want, I can do art for your poems. And I said, I'd like that. And look what she did. These are the poems I just read to you, two of them, really. I'm honored. It's just glorious. To desire the world as it is, not as it was. Falling feather attaches to new life for a moment. When the hammer approached, we thought, is that thing coming this way? We are the fractal. Drop to hear our own harmonics and the muffled underground hum of seeds. 
This was published by Poetry Magazine, who I'm very excited to be in the city of the Poetry Foundation, um, winning the Roof Lily. I was in this room for the Roof Lily Award, and it was daunting being with all these amazing people. And um, this poem got a lot of hate mail. Very interesting because of what I my theory about. Uh, you're all familiar with Bartleby the Scribner, written by Herman Melville. Well, I firmly believe, because keep in mind, Herman Melville was a Wall Street banker, all right? He's a Wall Street banker. Henry David Thoreau is Occupy Wall Street. That's how I look at it, right? So he hates them. I believe Bartleby the Scribner is an indictment against the transcendentalists, because by the end of that story, Bar you know, Bartleby is like, who says I prefer, prefer not to? He's curled up in the fetal position eating ginger snaps, children's food. It's his way of saying, fuck you and die. I'm out on the boats with whales, killing whales. I'm a real man, that kind of bullshit. The hill appeared in many dreams, never sure if it was real. Melville aimed his gun at the transcendentalists and named it Bartleby. We can prepare our shadows to be chewed apart or not, but the chewing will commence. I saw a spider eat a fly. I saw a praying mantis eat the spider. I did not mean to see these things. The spider caught my eye, then the spider was gone into the green body. We begin to discern waning time as seasons through our organs. Thumbing through calendars of the future till touching a year out of reach. Me a ghost, you a ghost. Another poem dedicated to the great vanishing trick. We build muscles, organs, bones at separate tables of our favorite restaurant, chewing to motion kept to the tides. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of poems in this book that is just, you know, it's so frustrating what's going on. In 2016, I did rituals in North Carolina to fight the anti-trans HB2 law. One of the rituals I did was I would sit on a low chair and blow bubbles, and then the kids would gather around, of course, you know, and then their parents would be a little concerned about this weird person with them, and they would fair enough. They'd walk over, and I would look up at the parents and say, these are queer bubbles, they're going to turn your kids queer. And the parents, of course, would freak out and apologize. Oh, I'm sorry, and just yank their kids out of the queer bubble, you know. I was like, do you really think they have the power to, like, give me a break. I'm trying to have a, you're going to be sorry when your kids are queer and now they're told they're second class citizens in this state? Or worse, killed, like many people. What was the point of today? Nothing more than microscopic creatures on my eyelids reaching for sunlight with me. How hard is your historical memory, as in gay bashing 101? Same day you learn hieroglyph means sacred carving. Elegy is not a form. It is a state of being the poet must write from. A faggot takes a beating from another holy book. And the band said, this is my four-leaf clover. What did they say? This is my four-leaf clover swallowed each other until we heard each other think. Queer pirates I have loved loosened my wilderness. No more miscounting butterflies in our utopia. Let's make poems that can rob a bank. Our little places within are not dungeons, remember, remember. Astronomers point satellites into space. The military points them down at us the inverse relationship between love we offer and what we give. This on and off button is another opportunity to believe there are only two choices. This too must end. What would it take to kill the imagination? It is important to wonder what our enemies are already thinking. You are so much blood, I love you. You're forced the force of blood. We give our thanks to the engineer of this meadow. Can you hear how it is flowing through our door? Flooding a better word. Sections of the day peel away to our curative vigor. We were going to be okay. 
We just did not know it at the time. I just want, you know, I'm just thinking about, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm somebody who voted for President Biden, and I'm just so upset that he killed so many people in Iraq recently with his airstrikes. I just, we have currently, to date, the United States has killed 360,000 civilians in Iraq alone. We are continuing to occupy this country, and the caravan of oil tankers just pumping that, those resources and stealing them. And I just, I mean, what, you know, just, it's unbelievable. 360,000 civilians. Never deny the warmth of a burning flag. Sing a 900-year-old death tune just in time to digitize empathy. Sing it for days. Sing it into chairs. Sit on it, fold the anus gingerly around it. Hold its sweetest note till we remember which ancestor was the first to forsake the power of an ant. Do you like your species, is my latest questionnaire. Meet me at the quarry where Michelangelo conjured David. Falling as felt all over the body the next day. Imagine trees hurting on the forest floor, our every cell singing the ghost of we shall rise again. If you call this planet evil one more time, I will have to learn to hold you better. Don't worry. Darkness always accuses us of falling on purpose. You know how to bulldoze me back up these hills. What does darkness know of light filling your navel in the middle of the afternoon? We have not lost our place in line. Shaking off the cold. Let's get this garden planted. Give our fruit away to one another. It was sexy how you politely declined the larger halo. Ocean waves travel thousands of miles, never revealing the source of their power. Enough poems have been wasted on human cruelty. We dig hard to find the other world, press pen with everything in us to write gate to open nine pages at once. Stay open. Ignore how much you want to close. I love you, it must be said. I love you. Can you hear it arriving after countless miles? Hold my hand as we feel relief with the crashing waves. I'm going to end, and if anybody has questions after I'm done with this little bit at the end, I'm going to end with brand new work that I've been doing since that I finished that book. And with this, it's called First Light. And what I do is I look at the sunrise. I was looking at it this morning here. Uh, wherever I'm at, and then an, some another time during throughout the day, I'll watch the sunrise on an outdoor public webcam. So the top one you see is in Istanbul, and the bottom one is the Tokyo Rail Yards, which is an extraordinary webcam. It's my favorite on the planet. So the idea of this is to continue doing this and writing with light. It also involves a second part of the ritual, which is visiting abandoned infrastructure in the United States, which there's quite a bit of watching it be taken back over by plants and raccoons. Um, and then when this is over, I'm going to watch all of these webcams in a row for 24 hours and then go to the doctor's office to be hypnotized to go back to the first time I saw sunlight as a child. I mean, who knows? It might not work. But I'm going to end with just three poems, these three new poems. Go ahead, call me a child for asking is there no war somewhere instead of this daily butterfly fighting suck a fan blade. You should break up is my only relationship advice. On the way to slaughter, pigs on truck pass deer with broken neck. Where love is merely an afterthought, we must banish the intrusions or become them. When you win the lottery, every dollar is someone else's dream. Once in a mirage, 
listening into the open hole for the fallen. If I see him again, questions for the crocodile inside my old friend, perfume of fiction on his breath. I'm glad I was there to stop myself from gnawing the burnt ends of forgiveness. We forget the Pledge of Allegiance on the path to finding no. A flower widening a crack in the rock. When we excel as father's least favorite, it's time to put a foot in the poem. I tell you there's nothing like waking in the flutter, passing hours of barbed wire across America, the road beneath us, the only public space. Thank you. <clears throat> I believe that there are microphones here that are come to you if you have a question. Oh, there's a question over here. There's one question over here. Thank you. I feel bad making you run. Oh, okay. Exercise. What's the matter with me? Hi, my name is Ruby Bradford. Hi. I really love your artwork. And the last, it was very great. And I like it a lot. And the last photograph which you did, I like the night background. And my favorite part with the crow everything. Thank you. And it's not easy. People die is you're not alone. You're a survivor. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, CA. It's your old friend, Carol. It's been a really Oh my long God, it's time. Carol. Miracle? Yeah. <laughs> I have a question about the shapes of your poems, which are so yes. beautiful. I'm curious, do you write by hand and then type them? And then does the shape change? Does, how, how does that work? Because I imagine analog and then digital, the shapes of the poems are going to be different in the versions. Can you talk about that process and how that goes? Thank you. And I see Jen next to you. Yeah. Oh my god, hello. Um, so when, you know, before the rituals in 2006, I was, most of my poems were on the left margin. And I firmly believe, you know, it's been thousands of years poets have been here and they've always talked wherever they're out on the planet about spirits and ghosts, muses, spooks, as um, Jack Spicer called them, speaking to him through the radio from Mars, you know, all these things were being whispered to, dictation. I believe this is true at this point. I don't even question it. And some people say, well, how do you prove it? I'm like, I'm not, I don't really want to prove anything to you. I don't care if you believe me or not. That's not interesting to me. Um, what I have to say about it, though, is very unexpectedly, from the very first one of the, so the very first one of these I did in 2006, I decided to eat, a, the first ones I did, I decided to eat single color food for a day for seven days. And with the red, so the red poem was the first one, and I found this red wig in a dumpster behind a beauty academy. It was really long down to my waist. And it was, I don't know what happened to this person, like they dropped out or were thrown out of class, but half of it was very straight like this, and the other half was very badly permed. And I had just, one of the things I like to do, I feel like I'm not answering your question, but one of the things I like to do is go to Barnes and Noble and don't buy anything. And um, go to the business section, and there's a subcategory about research, and I refer to that as the new anthropology because they're studying our behavior, also our physiology, the cell is things we absolutely don't need or want. And there's so many bizarre things that they're finding out about us that I thought, okay, well, let, and one of the things I was reading in 2006 prior to this crisis where I knew I needed to do something to change my writing there was an article that was mentioned, an essay, in this book I was reading where they said, well, we now know from this research that as much as 80 to 90 percent, 80 to 90 percent of human interaction is nonverbal. I don't know if I still believe it, but it's kind of mind-blowing. So I thought, well, you know, if I walk around the city with this red wig, I'll get a lot of nonverbal communication. 
and it'll be part of the whole thing. And it really was. Most people just were getting away from me as far as they could. But at the end of that first day, I learned two very valuable things. The first was it worked. I was present the entire time. Probably the most present I ever was in my life writing. Because these unorthodox steps, you can't think about anything else you're doing except that. And then the other thing I learned was I would have never written that poem at any other time for any other reason. In other words, the, or- the, the ritual orchestrates the language. So just tr- in, 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 in the middle of trusting all of that, because it was a lot of trust, this new thing for me, but I was like, I got to snap out of it. I need to change. And it's rough, you know, these changes. But then all of a sudden I started literally, I mean, I thought I was coming down with the flu because my, I wanted the vomit. And I thought, oh my God, what am I coming down with? And I realized that no, it was like these ghosts jamming their fists down my throat. They were basically saying, it came to me in a dream. They were like, we've been trying to show you the way out of the violence of the line, that straight line. So once I surrendered and started moving them off that left margin, I didn't feel like vomiting. And I was like, oh, you could have found a nicer way of telling me, but um, that's what it is. And I never know what they're going to look like. They're always a surprise. I just, um, I don't know, surrender. I'm a Capricorn. We don't like surrendering, you know. But when it comes to poetry, are there any other questions or comments? This was incredible. I just feel so inspired and I just want to share that. And then my other comment is I cannot wait to see what you do with light because scientists really cannot study it well. It, it's, a, it's a wave and a particle and it eludes the, the tests that they make on it. it. It will trick the scientist, the light does. So it's very elusive to scientists. So I'm really excited to see what you do with it. Thank you. That's exciting tricky to scientists. That's always fun. (laughs) They're good at figuring things out, though, like bombs and kamikaze drones that we're currently sending and overseas. It's just, you know. Yeah, they have another poem where I, in Amanda Paradise, where I I talk about, you know, just asking uh, these very creative people inventing at MIT these killer drones and these bombs to join us in the no-kill zone. It's kind of daunting when you go. The other thing I like to do at Barnes & Noble is go to the magazine section. Don't buy anything. And, um, but they always have the most up-to-date magazines. And those science magazines, I mean, when I was a kid in the 70s, they were all very concerned about the ozone layer and every issue. But now it's all about drones, drones, drones. And I don't mean like, you know, take pictures of your wedding from high up. I mean like how to murder people as many people as possible. And... Um, Every branch of our government has drone technology they're working hard on. And that's what you get in the magazines now. There's the, the, f- the format, as I see it now, is they interviewed these nerds at MIT who are very proud and they're very excited. It's like the age of nerds. You know, they're really got, they're full of themselves. They're not thinking about the murder, you know, behind it all, the blood. And um, then, then they're interviewing these, like, commanding officers and they're very, you know, as you imagine, so you just get a lot of this crazy interviews now instead of journalists doing their fucking job for a change, you know, talking about like, well, is this a good idea? Kamikaze drones? Are, we, are they really? Do we really need to find new ways? of 700 mass shootings in this country last year and 45,000 people dying of gun wounds. Many more people got shot, but, you know, that's a war report. And um, I think we've got it covered. And I think we need any more new... Technology. That was not your question. I'm sorry. You wouldn't even ask me. Are there any other questions? Oh. Hi, my name is Nomi, and I am a heart of hearing poet. And I was wondering, um, since you were doing a lot of poetry rituals with hearing field recordings, if you have any advice on how to listen. Yeah, uh, the field recordings with the extinct animals. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, they're all online. I mean, the ornithologists, mammalogists, entomologists even, they didn't know that they were creating a tomb. But they did, and they're all there. 
And so it was very, you know, I have to say too about using those real recordings. You know, I just got, I just had did, I had done a ritual to overcome depression. I don't subscribe to this ridiculous centuries old idea that depression helps us be creative. I think that that's absolutely ridiculous. And as much as I think it's ridiculous to think that alcohol helps you write better, you know, it's stupid. And um, I just call it stupid. I'm not even going to debate it anymore. When I was a kid in, in, the, in Philadelphia and, and as a teenager, there were always these old men around saying, wine loosens the tongue. I was like, what is wrong with you? I'm 17. I'm not even allowed. You're an alcoholic. You know, like, what is the, I don't want to, that's, if you're the goal, I'm going to take up golf instead, you know. But the thing is, I was not, I was not interested in being depressed, and it was, seemed like a very depressing thing, working with these field recordings. But the thing that was absolutely unexpected with Amanda Paradise was that I was euphoric doing it. I think, flood, and I flooded my body, you know, as I said. I mean, in other words, I didn't privilege the ears. We're, we're over 70% water. Nothing on this planet absorbs sound like water. So I started at the feet, and I moved the speakers up my body, filling the body with these sounds. And um, it was beautiful. It was like a conversation with old friends or something. It was the opposite of, of what I was afraid it might do. I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Yes? There's one more question oh, down here. Sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Madison. I'm a writer and a somatic educator, and I'm curious around um, your ritual process and um, how much of it is intuitive in the moment and how much of it is pre-planned and yeah, your process around deciding and crafting your rituals. Thank you. Yeah, um, well, there's always like a, a charcoal sketch of what I'm going to do. And then when I get there, things change. And I'm all about accepting the change. I'm all about, um, like, if I'm really going to take this seriously, I have to. Okay, so let me just say this. There was a, a ritual that I did in the city of Seattle years before lockdown where I went to visit the Black Mountain College poet Denise Levertov's grave. And I gave myself 27 minutes after passing into the threshold, through the threshold, to find her grave. And if I didn't, I had to spend the next hour reading and writing wherever I, whoever was other dead person I was in front of. And what I did not know is that the international superstar Bruce Lee is also buried there. And people fly from all over the world to see his grave. So all day long, there's this queue in front of his grave, and there's a lot of, you know, you know these sounds Bruce Lee made in his film that's being made very loudly. It just echoes throughout the whole graveyard. So, you know, I didn't put earplugs in. This is what Denise Levertov's grave is hearing. She's hearing Bruce Lee's, Bruce Lee's soundtrack, you know. So it became part of the ritual. I think it's really important to allow everything to happen. Um, hi, my name is Jackie. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I got a little frog in my throat. Um, I was wondering if you keep a record of all the steps of your rituals and if there are any that you've returned to regularly or years later. Thank you for asking that. Actually, all of my books have the rituals in them. I write the prose. I do, don't, I'm not a big fan of writing prose, so it's the last thing that I do. Um, to the annoyance of everybody who's putting the book out. I'm like, okay, you know. I'm just not a big fan of that place. But yeah, I want people to see what I did. So all, of, all the rituals that I've done are in the book. And I'm always encouraging people. Look, uh, okay, so I mean, I've been teaching these for years. And um, the thing is, people really need to understand how valuable their creativity is um, it's as vital as any other organ in our body, and it's the way to survival. I mean, it's how we survive, and I'm thinking about, all right, I'm just going to tell this story. I think this story is really important. This story is all about the importance of creativity. 
we mentioned I mentioned um, Andre Breton earlier, and most of you know who Andre Breton is, right? Yeah, right. He's the tyrant. That's why you remember him. Tyrants are remembered, but Robert Desnos is not remembered very much, and he was also part of the Surrealists. But by the Second Surrealist Manifesto, he is denounced by De Andre because he's not obeying and Daddy, Daddy Andre, and. Um, Well, he didn't care, does knows. He's just like, whatever, Andre, you're a jerk. And he just continues living his life, but then the Nazis are coming, and he knows that he needs to do something. So he joins the French Resistance. And, I mean, if you've ever seen pictures of Robert Desnos, D-E-S-N-O-S, you can see he's not built for a resistance movement. He's very sick, all that. he's got circles under his eyes, but he's going to do it. And he's captured by the Nazis, and he's sent to Auschwitz as a prisoner, and he goes to other, other camps. I don't understand why they move him around these death camps. But he's writing poems in these death camps. Can you imagine doing that? And, you know, as I like to point out, the Nazis did not have a little kiosk handing out notebooks and pens. He was using his fingernail clippings, eating, writing with shit and dirt on scraps. That's how desperate he was. And the reason he was so desperate is because he knew that it was his tools as a poet they were going to keep him alive because he knows that that means observation deep discerning powerful observation of the world and what he's doing as he's writing these poems is he's studying the guards to see what they're doing to protect themselves from what they're doing to the prisoners and one day the guards arrive with a flatbed truck and they put Desnos and his fellow inmates on this from the barracks on this truck. And Desnos knows they're on their way to the gas chamber to inhale a Zyklon B and they'd all be dead in 15 minutes. Keep in mind the Surrealists were very involved with the occult and he was their resident palmist reading palms. So he gets off that truck first and he starts grabbing his fellow inmates' hands, his wrists, and saying, and in German, for the spectacle, it's all this thing for the guards in German, using the names of the prisoners, as you know, they had tattoos of numbers because they didn't want, they wanted to completely dehumanize them. He's using their names. Ezra, you're going to have, he's focusing on the lifeline. You have a very long lifeline. You're going to live, you know, and you and your wife, beautiful stories he's telling you. The guards are really angry and confused, but he doesn't shut up. And then he breaks through them. He destroys them psychically and they become despondent and they put them back on the truck and send them back i'm sure they go kill other people or they would have been executed but three weeks later the allied forces liberate the camp and all those people were still alive and they've been telling us these stories for more than half a century about the poet who rescued all these lives one day without a single bullet fired that is the true power of creativity and at occupy wall street every time i would go there i saw that 75% of everybody I met at Occupy Wall Street was an art student, a creative writing student. When the police would interfere, they would huddle together and come up with ideas around them. Brilliant to use creativity to survive and thrive, you know. It has nothing to do with what you asked me, but. Anything else? Well, thank you very much.